on the corner of East 27th Street and 3rd Avenue. Now I just took a quick shot of the uh, street sign there, but it's a bit loud because of construction is going on. However, today we're going to do a little tour down East 26th Street. The goal is to show you uh, the historical places down East 26th. And this is going to be a part of a new series that I'm doing. There's going to be hundreds of videos. Um, you can see I've only got a handful of subscribers right now, but eventually we'll get uh, we'll catch up with and get a bunch of subscribers on there. Now, my goal was to start on 27th to get down to 26, uh, because there's uh, the first place on our agenda is something that's a little hidden away. And I'd heard that they were going to do some construction here. Uh, and the place that I'm going to show you today is no longer going to exist. Well, as it turns out, the construction's already started, so I can't enter on 27th, but they told me I can enter on 26th. While I'm here though, right opposite, there's a bar. And that bar was a huge part of my life in the 1990s, uh, 2000s. Uh, right now it's called Gem. But it used to be known as the Rodeo Bar. And this is where every weekend my friends Greg and Joanne would put rockabilly bands. And every weekend for more than a decade, I would come to this bar. I've seen hundreds of bands here. Uh, all the way from the guys in the 1950s. Let me back up a little bit. Uh, people like Ronnie Dawson. Sonny Burgess, Billy Lee Riley, Jack Scott, uh, Charlie Gracie, a whole bunch of the old 50s artists. They've had uh, European artists come over and perform at the Rodeo Bar, or what used to be the Rodeo Bar. Uh, the Rockats, the Polecats, Hicksville Bombers, uh, Wildfire Willie and the Ramblers, and then pretty much every uh, <coughs> rockabilly band you could think of from the 1990s, 2000s, would have played there in the rodeo bar. I'm only doing this part for my friends because uh, uh, a whole bunch of us, I'm sure, miss hanging out in this place. There's some, been some pretty wild nights in there, but that used to be the rodeo bar on the corner of 27th and 3rd. Now, I'm gonna walk down to 26th Street now, but before I do, I'm gonna show you the entrance here on uh, 27, which this is where I intended to go today. But as you can see, the construction crews are out already. Now, the only reason I'm coming down here right now is this is the only street sign for Broadway Alley, which is going to be the first thing on our agenda there. Uh, on the 26th side, there's no, uh, no street sign because apparently it keeps getting uh, stolen. So I'm going to go around to 26th Street because that's where uh, I can apparently enter Broadway Alley. Now the alley itself has been around since like the uh, 1880s. In fact, the New York Times did a rather racially insensitive article back in the 1880s to describe the inhabitants of Broadway Alley. around that time the alley had tenement buildings on either side of it now the alley is only 10 feet across so if you can imagine <coughs> that there used to be tenement buildings on either side of the uh, alley, you can imagine how crammed in it was there. Uh. Now the one thing about this alley is to this day there is still a residence there on the alley. And that kind of blows me away a little bit. 
that in this day and age, there's one street in Manhattan that's got one address on there. Oh man. Now, the one thing about Broadway Alley is it's supposedly the last dirt road in Manhattan. As you can see, I'm walking on that dirt road now. And unfortunately, I would have loved to have gone all the way through because it looks like even the residence, number eight, Broadway Alley, <coughs> right now is part of the construction. Maybe they've demolished it already. My goal had been to come down the alley here and uh, preserve it, to be honest with you, before uh, they put construction all over it. And it looks like I'm a little too late. But we can at least get the dirt road. This is the last dirt road in uh, Manhattan. There might be one or two more north of here, uh, I'm not 100% certain, but that's a bit of a blow. That's taken me, uh, taken me back a bit, because I really want to show you this alley and hopefully find some signs of what it used to be like in the 1800s. But that's the best we're going to get for now. Now part of the alley right here, there's some old uh, Belgian blocks right over there. Um, these would have lined the alley back in the 1880s. Uh, and these are just the remnants of what's left. Uh, basically nothing. And the other item of historical uh, reference here for this alley, like I said, there's no sign on this side of the street. It's going to be this item here. Let me uh, step into the road a little bit. Now, as you can see, uh, we've got a fluorescent lamp on this uh, lamp post on the corner here. But if you actually look at the uh, lamp holding itself, the fixture, that's actually been there since about 1880, or sorry, about 1890. And that's an old cast iron uh, lamp holder for the old gas lamps that they used to have in this uh, neighborhood. There's very few of them left, so I figured I'd catch that while I was here. Anyway, there's Broadway Alley. Um, sorry I couldn't give you more, but they've already started construction. So this is probably going to be the last year ever going to see a Broadway alley. Okay, let's move on. We're going to cross over the street here and hopefully not get knocked down. So we can walk up to the, uh, the next item on the agenda today. Now before we get to the next building, which is going to be this building right here, 
when I walk around Manhattan, uh, my eyes are always everywhere. I'm always trying to find old signs of uh, old Manhattan. And right on this corner, we have one. Now, if you look at the uh, water tower right there, right below it, you might not be able to see, uh, see all of it by the naked eye, but there's an old uh, sign that's about 100 years old. In fact, this particular one, I believe was put there in 1905. Uh, it's some print press. Uh, looks like Schlinger. Uh, what I'm going to do is once I film this next little segment, I'm going to come back and take a picture of that. And then I'll add it to the uh, blog. And hopefully we can get an idea of what that says up there. But the next item on our agenda is right across the street here. What I'm going to do, I'm going to walk down to the uh, halfway down the block here. So that hopefully we can get a good idea of what the aesthetic looks like from the outside. Now this building here is known as the 69th Regiment Armoury. Let's come this side so we can get a close look. Now I'm just going to pan around so that you can get an idea of the building. Uh, on the corner of each building you'll see a list of all of the, uh, the battles that this regiment has uh, partaken in. Now the 69th Regiment are known as the Fighting Irish. Now what I'd recommend you do, I'm going to put a link in the description and you guys can uh, do some research on the 69. I want to focus mainly on New York <clears throat> and obviously what these guys do is, you know, a lot of it is outside New York but they're a big part of New York so I figured I'd uh, at least show you this. They got the name the Fighting Irish, uh, it was given to them by General Lee, uh, General Robert E. Lee, during the Battle of Fredericksburg. He mentioned about them on the battlefield, and then afterwards he also wrote about the tenacity and bravery of the fighting Irish. Uh, when they were fighting against insurmountable odds, they continued to, uh, to fight, and the name of the fighting Irish stuck. Now, The other historical part in relation to New York is the Fighting Irish are always the first to lead the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York City. What happens is the commander of the parade will go up to the 69th Regiment and say, are the 69th ready? To which the leader of the 69th Infantry Regiment will say, the 69th is always ready. Now, also included uh, in this building, believe it or not, there's actually a 5,000 seat arena. The arena was built um, sometime in the early 1900s. And one of the first events they had here uh, in 1913, they had a, an art exhibition which uh, didn't go down too particularly well. It was the first large-scale modern art show in the United States. It was featuring contemporary artists such as Vincent van Gogh, uh, Pablo Picasso, and Ray Matisse. And then also inside of here, um, uh, it, it is a bit of a concert hall, but not maybe uh, one of the top-notch concert halls in Manhattan. But people like Eric Clapton have played here. And from the 1920s onwards, it's been a boxing venue. Now again, this is not a boxing venue where uh, perhaps world champions take part, but the Garda from Ireland came over to fight the New York Police Department in here. Uh, and a couple of fun facts about this building. In 1948, the first ever televised roller derby games 
took place inside this building. You can actually find them on uh, YouTube right now. Uh, if you type in uh, 1940s roller derby, the footage you will see was filmed inside of here. And also from 46 to 53, the New York Knicks, this was their second home. Now, uh, obviously the Knicks play at Madison Square Garden, but there are certain times of the year where the Knicks and the Rangers are not able to play in Madison Square Garden. So they have to find alternate venues. Now nowadays it's a lot easier because if you see a block of Rangers and Knicks games where they're playing away from home, and that means that something's happening at the garden. But the historical piece about this building, for those who like uh, some base basketball trivia, the New York Knicks' first ever home win was inside of this building. Uh, it wasn't at Madison Square Garden. Now this is the first video that I'm making in this series. Uh, I know I'm going to need a lot of work, uh, but we've got to start somewhere, right? So I figured I'd show you some of the historical sites on uh, East 26, just to get us started. Um, I've got a lot of history to share with you guys over the coming months, uh, in fact coming years. Every street in Manhattan has a story, believe me. Uh, it's going to be my job to dig those stories out for you. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go over to the uh, building itself and we'll see what signs we can see on here. And that will give us some further history on the 69th Regiment Armoury. Now what I'll do, I'll just focus on this for a sec and then you can pause the video and uh, read it if you so wish. And there's also one on the other side here. Now right on the corner they do have the uh, traditional first stone for the year it was the building was laid. <clears throat> I think it was 1906. Might actually be 1904 but well uh, we'll have a look and see in just a second there. Okay, so it was 1904. Now, I've got a little walk ahead of me before we get to the next location. But before we do that, I want to uh, just educate you on one more thing. Today is August the 15th when I'm filming this. Uh, and then obviously when most of you are going to watch this, it's going to be August the 16th. Right on the corner here is Baruch College. Now, Baruch College runs uh, on Lexington between 24th and 25th and goes all the way back to 3rd Avenue, where we just came from, about 90% of the way back. Now, we're on the northwest corner. On the southeast corner of this building used to be the RCA Victory... RCA Victor, sorry. RCA Victor uh, Recording Studio. Now that's on 24th Street, uh, but I want to show you this because tomorrow is August the 16th, uh, or when you're watching this, it's going to be August the 16th, uh, and that's the 42nd anniversary of Elvis Presley uh, dying. 
So, I figured while we were here, I'd just tell you that inside this building, that's where Elvis recorded his double A side, Hound Dog and Don't Be Cruel. Now, when I do 24th Street, we'll get more of, uh, uh, more history on that, because obviously there's more than Elvis recorded at that particular building. But I figured as it's gonna be August 16th, I'll go ahead and share that with you right now. Okay, so we've got a little walk before the next uh, location. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna turn the camera off for a moment, and then we'll see you when we get to the next spot. Okay guys, we've arrived at the next location here. Now, when you watch this, uh, if you've got feedback for me, please by all means give it to me. Uh, I know it's not perfect, but this is the first video. Hopefully uh, I'll get better as things go along. Right now, what we're looking at is the New York Life Building. Now this plot of land right here has a long and wanted history in New York City. Back in 1874, P.T. Barnum uh, leased this land. And now this part, we're on Madison, and this is between 26 and 27, going all the way back to Park Avenue. Now, P.T. Barnum leased this land, and the first thing that he built on here was the Great Roman Hippodrome. Uh, that was full of chariot races and all different kinds of shows that P.T. Barnum was notorious for. Uh, however, there was a bit of a problem with that. Uh, he built it as an open-air um, arena. I just let that guy who was talking go out my way there. So, um, he built it as an open-air arena. Obviously in New York City, it is boiling hot in the summer and even more so brutally cold in the winter. So an open air arena in this location was destined to fail. So he was only there for a couple of years for the Great Roman Hippodrome. And then in uh, 1877, the band composer, Patrick Gilmore, he took over this building and it was known as Gilmore Gardens. Now coincidentally, during this time uh, in 1877, the Westminster Dog Show took place on that plot of land right there at, in Gilmore's Gardens. Now the Westminster Dog Show is notorious for being a part of uh, Madison Square Garden, but it was actually here two years before Madison Square Garden was built. Which brings us on to our next subject, Madison Square Garden. This plot of land right here was the original Madison Square Garden in 1879. Uh, a group of investors got together. Uh, the original garden lasted for uh, 11 years, then was torn down and they built Madison Square Garden 2, which was also built on the same land right here. Now, the notorious history of Madison Square Garden dates back all the way to the 1800s. Uh, boxing especially. It was in this arena that John L. Sullivan would fight. Uh, in fact, he won the um, uh, he won the title here from Paddy Ryan, I believe it was, uh, sometime in 1882, I think it was, uh, something like that. But it's got a long history of boxers that appeared here. Um, Gene Tunney versus Harry Greb took place in this arena. Uh, Jack Dempsey, James J. Corbett, uh, Jess Willard. They all fought in the uh, original Madison Square Garden, which was located on this corner right here. Uh, professional wrestling as well has just as much history in this building. In fact, for you uh, wrestling aficionados, George Hackenschmidt beat Tom Jenkins on that plot of land in 1905 to become the first world heavyweight champion. And like pretty much every uh, uh, wrestling person you could think of uh, wrestled in this building. Um, Frank Gotch, Ed Strangler Lewis, Joe Stetcher, Stanley Lissabisco, uh, you name them. It's got a long, long history. Now hopefully um, uh, that's not too boring me just pointing out a building and telling you the history of it. If it is, let me know. Uh, I'm quite, uh, quite open to uh, changing things up. 
Uh, this is a learning curve for me and I just wanted to start to show you what I know of New York City history. So that's going to do it for today's video. Uh, right now we're on the corner of Madison Square Park, not where Madison Square Garden was, just so you know. <laughs> um, so I'm going to wrap up for today. If you did enjoy it, I've got tons of videos coming up. Uh, so please go ahead and subscribe if you feel uh, that this is something you would enjoy. Uh, and I'll see you on the next video.